you want to go first, Caitlin? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... Hello, and welcome back to The Great Game. Also welcome to 2024. Uh, I'm Patrick, and as we went over in our last few episodes, 2023 was a pretty big year for Mega Games in Australia, and the world over, as always, but it was a pretty quiet year for our podcast. So in 2024, we are looking at amending that, and we've got plenty of conversations and interviews the world over that we've got lined up for you. So hoping that you will enjoy. Uh, as our first episode for the year, um, this was a good chat that we had with Katie, Justin and Monty from Adelaide Mega Games here in Australia. Um, Adelaide's a little group that didn't really exist at the start of the pandemic formally. They came about during those quiet years and um, have coupled together a, a, a pretty consistent, strong group over there. And recently, uh, at the end of 2023, ran Watch the Skies. Not as their first maker game, but as their third, which in itself was um, a bit of a break of the mould. So it was a really good conversation to have with some, some old friends and some new ones. And um, a bit nostalgic to talk about how everyone gets started in this space. There are a few little technical glitches in this episode, I think just from uh, the, the haziness of the start of the new year and having lots of people on the call, but uh, bear with us and hope you enjoy. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Really keen for this conversation and to hear how everything is going in Adelaide. Uh, before we started, we've got a few different uh, voices, I suppose, today. Uh, so I might just ask you all to introduce yourselves. Starting with you, Monty, did you want to just um, say hi and let us know how you, how you came to be in this, in this place in the mega game world? No, absolutely. I started mega gaming as most people do with the shut up and sit down, watch the skies video, thought that was pretty cool and that mm -hmm. I could do it myself. Then I discovered this fascinating podcast called The Great Game and <laughs> got some ideas about running a game called God Emperor. Wow. That's, um, I was going to say, we, we never have anyone who has like an original story uh, about how to answer that question. But I think you're the first person who said that God Emperor and, and, and this um, podcast is what got you into it. So that's exciting. When did you first hear about God Emperor? Um, uh, yeah, I think when I absolutely started, started, I wanted to just get as much information about the hobby, especially in Australia, before I decided to delve into the practical things. Um, mm. So I stumbled on this um, podcast I can't remember through where. I think it was just a list of all podcasts for mega gaming. Um, and thought, ooh, Australia, this is incredibly convenient. <laughs> I hope, um, I hope uh, we didn't uh, like send you too far, <laughs> too far off, off track uh, with our ramblings. No, absolutely. Um, I adored um, listening to all of that. Just having ceaseless amounts of ideas and concepts thrown at me it just was a very good introduction to the hobby um just awesome. knowing how deep it can go that's so lovely know. to hear um, it's it's really great to hear from one of our several uh maybe three listeners it's very good <laughs> um justin you are returning you were on the podcast um about three and a half years ago uh, to talk to us about a different game did you want yep. to just remind everyone who you are and where you're where you're coming from? Hi everyone. Uh, I'm yeah. My name's Justin. I'm one of uh, Sydney Mega Games homegrown enthusiasts. Um, I was a player in Pat's first ever game back in 2014, and I was immediately hooked. Uh, and then yeah, ever since I've been had an insatiable appetite to play in Mega Games. And then when I moved to Adelaide at the start of 2020. Uh, there wasn't much around, so I kind of took it upon myself to um, start cultivating a scene in Adelaide. And then, well, we all know what happened in 2020, so mm. that got set back a little bit. But we got there in the end. Yeah, good. So does that 
is the appropriate title you're a city mega gamers alumni or an expat do you think oh uh, i'm gonna leave that up to you you can okay. decide on the nomenclature for your um, yeah okay the people who've flown the coop and katie uh you are first time on the podcast but you also uh, came came out of the the sydney group did you want to just tell us a little bit about your background in the in the hobby Sure. Uh, my name is Katie. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm Justin's partner. Um, yes, yeah, so he kind of dragged me into mega gaming. Um, my first game was uh, Unrest in Idrunor. Um, I can't even remember what year that was. Um, but yeah, I enjoy causing mischief and mayhem in a mega game. And when when we moved to Adelaide, Justin was like, "Oh yeah, I want to get it started." And I said. I guess I can, I can do that. So I've kind of, yeah, you know, girl bossed my way into this. <laughs> By accident. And then um, later that year, you were sitting on a panel at PAX, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my accidental girl bossing. Um, Excellent. I, I got, uh, yeah, not dragged in, but um, the Melbourne Mega Gamers asked if I wanted to be a part of the panel. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. And they're like, oh, yes, and the president of Adelaide Mega Games. And I'm like, oh. Sure. Guess I am. <laughs> As of right now. As of right now, I am now the president. <laughs> and that's also awesome. a deep cut, um, Unrest in Idrinal. That was 2015. Uh, that was our yes. second game. Um, and one of the, the many games I've got, which I refuse to speak of. But, I liked uh, it. Uh, Idrinal I... was a classic. <laughs> I, enjoyed, I enjoyed it. I got to be a, a goddess, mm -hmm. which was fun. Um, and, you know, I did some sort of impassioned speech, I remember, that uh, I don't remember what the speech was about, but I know I did an impassioned speech. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone I've spoken to about Idranor has nothing but glowing reviews, Pat. I think that's one deserving of a revisit. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm. noted, noted. You might have to bring it back. <laughs> awesome. So um, after, yeah, getting that initial spark, what was the... What was the first moment like when you were saying, like, let's get a Adelaide group together? Like, tell us about the, I guess, the first start of that and the inspiration there. So I think I decided to actually commit um, to organizing a mega game was as the pandemic was slowly starting to wane off um, and things were coming back out. Um, uh, I, at the time, was the president of the Adelaide University Games Group, um, which is an acronym for Games and Miscellaneous Entertainment Society, a name that I have absolutely no credit in inventing, but have been sharing ever since. <laughs> um, uh, so I managed to convince the rest of my committee to start preparing and organising our first mega game, which we ran in about winter of 2022. The original intention was to run God Emperor, but we decided on something a little smaller and more manageable. So we went with Aegon's Conquest as our first game. Mm. And so that was something that you just grabbed uh, from the international market and ran sort of out of the box. Did you, um, did you, how, how was that experience, I suppose, in a nutshell? Did you feel like you had to do a, lo a lot of legwork? Um, in terms of finding it, um, not really, um, uh, given that I didn't have much connections within the mega game sphere at that time, the only things I could find were what were available on the market. Um, and then when I went to drive through RPG, the only two games available for sale were God Emperor and Aegon's Conquest. Mm. So my options were relatively limited at that time. <laughs> Very Game of Thrones themed. <laughs> two uh, options. Yes. And, and, and how did that first game go in, in 22? Uh, the first game went pretty well. Um, uh, in, it was quite easy to understand. Um, uh, I think we just made a few um, uh, like cleanups of the rule to make things presentable for an audience that had no experience with mega gaming at all, both mm. on the running and playing side of things. Um, but in terms of actual game day, I like to think it went pretty well in terms of um, in, in terms of player experience. Definitely a few growing pains. Um, uh, I don't know how common this is in other games, but our 
war table definitely got a bit sluggish at times. Right. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think the day was a pretty good success. Um, we even had a, a few groups dress up in serious costumes, which I was incredibly surprised about. Some people took it incredibly seriously from the get-go, and it impressed me immensely. I think that's one of the key things that, you know, solidified the games in Sydney was, and Justin, you were one of these people rocking up to the first Watch the Skies, or, well, <clears throat> legally distinct to Watch the Skies game. <laughs> and there were all these people in uh, uniform and, and costume and stuff that I had never, uh, like, I hadn't even considered that people would do that, and I didn't tell anyone to either. And they just all, there was a hive mind effect. Uh, very impressive. Uh, so it seems to be like the hallmark of a first mega game. Everyone wants to uh, go all out just in case it's the only one. Mm. And so that was 22. Um, when did Justin and Katie, when did you land on the scene and how did you come to be here running, running uh, Watch the Skies with Monty? Well, so back when we still lived in Sydney, Pat, you'd been on my case for several years about making the transition from player to um, designer slash uh, moderator. And eventually you were successful. And so in 2019, you know, we, uh, I came on board to help you with as the fire dies. And then in, in the later half of 2019, um, I designed, well, James Archer and I designed our first game, which was So Say We All. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and that was in October of 2019. And by that point, my our upcoming move to Adelaide had been confirmed, so we knew this was going to happen. And my personal kind of momentum for mega game creation and running was quite high, and I was really keen to carry that over into Adelaide. Uh, yeah, but then that didn't happen because of a global event mm. that we all know and love. Uh, but it was always in the back of my mind that, you know, once... You know, once events that required getting a large number of people in a room were going to be permissible again, I was always keen to get back into it. And I just needed that nudge to get started. Mm. Uh, and then in January of this year, 2023, uh, we went over to Melbourne to play in a game that they were running, Crisis in Elysium. Uh, and the folks at Melbourne had been in talks with Monty, um, but I still had no idea that the games club at Adelaide Uni were putting on mega games and in fact had designs to run another game later in 2023. And so they were kind enough to put us in touch. And so that's when I met Monty and then Caitlin and I offered to come aboard and help them out because we had, you know, we'd been around the block a bit. We'd had some experience, <laughs> some insights we could offer to help, you know, help them facilitate this game. This ain't our first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, well, I was keen to kind of to come on board and use that to uh, suss out what the you know general interest level was in Adelaide, and if you know if there was that kind of critical mass to get our own standalone Adelaide mega game you know community established here and. Yeah, turns out there is. Monty did a great job with their first two games and really like laid the groundwork for us. Mm. And you say two games. That was there was another um, just before Watch the Skies, and that was your doing, was it, Monty? Uh, yes. So the second game was um, God Emperor itself, which Justin and Katie helped out with. That was um, winter of this year. So a mega game every six months for me. Uh, nice. That's that a good track record for uh, starting yeah. off. Yes. Um, uh, we decided to um, uh, do that one, seeing as though we had enough um, support and interest for another um, game in the in another game after Aegon's Conquest. Mm. Um, uh, I'm very, very, very glad that Justin and Katie were able to help out with that one because it was a significant step up um, uh, from the prior. Um, uh, I think we had a control team of five for Aegon's Conquest, and that blossomed to, I think, around 13 for God Emperor. Mm -hmm. And 
having people who had a lot more experience with mega gaming just was such a blessing. I didn't even realize after the game itself, just all of the ways that I would not have been able to fully understand things without their assistance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that endorsement, I think we'll call them alumni. Um, but that's great. <laughs> it, we'll it, make it. <laughs> it makes a huge difference having having those people around and that knowledge. Um, and so it was a real sort of upscaling to get to where you are now, it sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, uh, I like to consider myself definitely more experienced now that I have um, a bit of experience on both sides of the playing field. Um, but um, I think after participating in a total of what is it now five games at this point both playing and running i definitely think i appreciate being more in the logistic side of things rather than directly engaging with um creating concept organizing stuff with players right that makes sense so more like the organizational side of the yeah. games absolutely um uh also, like a little bit of like designing dots for players to receive, not more the artistic side, but also just like making them easily understandable, I guess. Mm. That's good to know early on, because um, it's a valuable sort of role that everyone needs in their group. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice thing that I've found with... Um, this this crew of of people that Monty has kind of already cultivated before Katie and I, you know, came onto the scene. Several of um, you know, the people that we kind of co opted from the games club who ran Aegon's Conquest and God Emperor, and then who came on board with Adelaide Mega Games to help us run Watch the Skies a few weeks ago. Uh, they have this very clear vision, like individually, about what parts of the game design and facilitating process that they gravitate towards um, which is something that i haven't really encountered too much you know encountering people with that clarity of vision about the specific things that they gain satisfaction from in this whole process so it's been really smooth and seamless to work with to work with everyone here it's been great hmm. awesome that is amazing i think yeah in my experience a lot of the people I run into wear a, a lot of different hats in um, running mega game stuff. So having people who are so who are more precise about the particular thing that they enjoy and get joy from in making mega games that sounds hugely valuable. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely come from the uh, Patrick Doyle school of mega game creation, where I just like to do everything. <laughs> um, so it's nice to have the <laughs> yeah, people with their kind of specialist areas. Perfect. So moving on to Watch the Skies, in the lead up to it, what were your experiences of it before you ran it? I had not played in it before. Um, so this was, it was kind of new. Like I knew Justin that that was his first mega game and I was, you know, keen because I, I would say I'm definitely more of a player. I like to be in there so in chaos um <laughs> but to kind of you know so i ran the un and they were like oh what can i do i'm like do whatever you want like you know because i i'm very much like if, if you want to blow up the un please do it if you want to you know start killing people in game <laughs> please do so you know so i was i came into it i guess Excited because, you know, this was, I guess, what Justin had kind of described. It was like, you know, the gateway, gateway drug of mega gaming. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess, yeah, I was, I was keen to, to see what it was about and, um, you know, try and, I guess, because I was obviously aware that we, you, we couldn't, like, the licensing, you can't change anything and then still call it Watch the Sky. So it was like, okay, well, you know. We just have to run it and see how it goes. So that was kind of exciting as well to see, you know, if when eventually we do create more mega games, uh, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, that kind of stuff. Mm. And that's it's very important 
to note there that, as you said, the licensing was very strict, and uh, so Justin's actually never played Watch This Watch This Guys. He played the third kind, but um, uh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, a subtle but important mm. distinction. <laughs> very true. Uh, legally distinct. Um, and Mon Monty, you said that you had watched the video. Obviously, you, uh, as um, KD said, you had watched the gateway drug of mega gaming. Uh, but had you you hadn't played in um, the classic sort of Watch the Skies or even sort of a spin-off geopolitical alien game before? Uh, no, I think um, uh, like the closest I'd ever come to that sort of even contemporary sort of game is Crisis in Elysium. Um, but I definitely knew a lot about um, Watch the Skies. Its reputation did precede itself, um, mainly just from discussions in podcasts and everything else. Um, so I sort of had a pretty good idea about what to expect going in to run the game. Um, uh, this was definitely one of the ones where I was hands off compared to the other ones. Now that I had Justin and Katie um, uh, taking the reins, so to speak. So it allowed me to focus a lot more on how to interact with players. I was science control for the game, so just allowing people to go crazy with their ideas and concepts. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, nice. So having seen it and heard about it and read it, but not actually played in it before, was there anything, once you actually got into kind of running it, um, Monty and Katie, were that, was there anything that really surprised you about it or that wasn't what you expected once you started gearing up to actually put it into play in, perp in practice? I don't think so. Like, I kind of knew that it was, I guess, similar in, in terms to other mega games where there's the, you know, different theatres of play and there's, you know, a war table, there's a science table, there's, you know, the UN and I guess other games that I've played in have been similar to that. So I kind of, once, you know, I read through the rules, um, briefly um <laughs> i i was like okay yeah they you know it seems pretty similar to other mega games i've been in so i can understand why it would be a good yeah beginners one um i guess um i don't think there was anything that was unexpected um justin kind of explained it to me pretty well anyway and i mostly listened so i was <laughs> i think i was you know not surprised I mean, you'd played in two spin-offs of Watch the Skies prior to this, so... Have I? Yeah, we played in uh, Brave New World, which was a Sydney Mega Games one. And oh, then, yeah. do you remember That's where right. we, we went down to Geelong and we played in uh, Global Meltdown? That's right. Oh, were they spin-offs of Watch the Skies? Uh, well, I mean, Pat, I mean... I can't, Pat can speak for Brave New World, but I think Global Meltdown was a, it was a, you know, quote-unquote sequel slash spin-off to Watch the Skies. Yeah, that's right. The uh, uh, the Lux legendary pulp group, who I'm not sure are operating uh, anymore. I, might no, be I think wrong they've there. been mostly... What's, what remains of pulp has been assimilated into mm. Melbourne Mega Gamers. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But no, yeah, no. they did uh, run uh, Watch the Skies, and that was the sequel, yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay. Look, mm. so many Mega Games, so little so time, many mega you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just quickly, Monty... Did anything come out of, like, when you started organizing the event and reading the rules, anything surprise you that you weren't really expecting out of the uh, the ultimate Watch the Skies? Um, uh, not really surprising, as I'd sort of heard about it going in, but just compared to the other games I've run, how freeform it is, for lack of a better word, just the um freedom given to the players and the organizers and just how things can really turn out so to speak there's a lot less defined sorry i'm trying to think of the word for it um like structure um especially compared to other games like god emperor for example mm -hmm. i once again i come from a board game background where everything is very well defined um mechanically so a bit of a Bit of a weird experience, but I like to think I adapted to it pretty well. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I think both Aegean's Conquest and God Emperor are more on the board gamey side of the spectrum, and I think part of that is probably 
reactions to watch the skies and like tweaking it and taking it in a different direction so yeah it's very inter- it's very true that watch the skies is way more freeform than um you might expect when you get into it and just before we dive into the actual game and your take on it um i feel like you may have answered this question in a few ways but was what was the the key thing that made you pick watch the skies especially when you'd already run there'd already been two games in uh, melbourne Ah, uh, sorry, in Adelaide, and there were a whole bunch of games floating around in Melbourne and Sydney and in Brisbane um, that you could grab. How did? Why did you land on Watch the Skies for game number three? Uh, so the reason why we settled on Watch the Skies was, I mean, there were I think there were three main things that fed into it. Um, the first one was that I was conscious that the preceding two games that had been run were both very similar in theme, and I, I wanted to you know, show that mega gaming is a wide, diverse hobby with, you know, kind of any any setting is free game. So I really wanted to move away from that medieval fantasy setting. So that was the first consideration. Uh, The second one is that considering that the Adelaide scene was quite new, uh, I didn't want to kind of come out of the gate with, you know, the standalone Adelaide Mega Games. Well, cause this was our first official game that we ran under the Adelaide Mega Game name. Uh, prior to this, you know, had been under Monty's leadership with Games Club. Yep. Uh, and I didn't want to kind of come out of the gate with some random game that I designed with some crazy setting that was, you know, a bit out of left field. I thought the having the name recognition of watch the skies would also be a a help, you know, and we have, you know, handy, the handy, uh, shut up and sit down videos that exist. We can point people towards that to Mm -hmm. give them a pretty accurate idea of what they'd be in for. Um, yeah. And then the third one was just, I didn't have any, any game ideas that I thought were sufficiently developed enough to kind of roll out as, you know, something we'd created ourselves. Um, mm. And yeah, I was conscious you guys were running the ARC in Sydney, so I didn't want to take, you know, that one as well because we ran God Emperor in quite close proximity to Sydney <laughs> yes. running God Emperor, and I didn't want to do that twice in a row. Got it. Yep. Um, so I wanted just to get another game that we could run, you know, more or less out of the box without... Mm going through you know the grueling process of creating an entire game from scratch yeah yeah that yeah makes awesome sense. well let's dive into it a bit um i think let's run through the main kind of factions or roles of the game and kind of talk about how your experiences um with each of them were um so first of all, um, Katie, you mentioned you were running the UN. How did you find that, and what were your experiences with that kind of side of the game like? Yeah. Um, so coming into it, I suppose. Um, well, originally I was supposed to be like a, a mod for the teams, and then we had someone drop out last minute, and Justin was like, "You're on. Oh, uh, you're on UN now." And I was like, "Okay, I can do that, I guess." Um, so. It was actually pretty, I don't want to say easy, but I guess I, I, it was very much, you know, I could just kind of sit back and let the players um, chat or, you know, chat more like, you know, argue about the, uh, the different crises that had popped up for that turn and what they were going to do about it. Um, and it, it definitely, because I know in... God Emperor, I was at the war table, so it was very structured, you know, there was a lot of, um, this is, you know, this has to be done in this five minutes, this has to be done in this five minutes, whereas in the UN for um, Watch the Skies, it was very, um, more laid back, I guess, <laughs> which yeah. is, which is what I liked. Um, I, yeah, there was, you know, a couple of, obviously, I don't know, all the all the ins and outs and details of all of the rules. So there was obviously a couple of times where I'd be like, just, um, please explain. And he was like, yeah, do this. I was like, okay, cool. That makes, you know, but it wasn't, there was nothing I was, you know, super worried about. Everyone seemed to have a good time, which is 
you know, something I'm kind of conscious of. Like, obviously, when you're, you know, they have to come to this area every turn and to get things done. So, you know, making sure that it was a, um, at least enjoyable for everybody. Um, I was kind of ex surprised. There was one point where um, we'd, we'd come back in for the UN and I got told, um, oh, yeah, um, there is a dead alien carcass strung up on the building of the UN with a uh, a note that said, and I have the note here, where did I put it? <laughs> oh, can't be trusted. Mm. And Whoa. so I was like, oh yeah, I was so excited to kind of like, you know, get everybody in and be like, you know, tell them and be like, all right, cool. And um, so, you know, I sat them down. And I was like, oh, you know, let's wait for everyone. And I told them, I was like, you know, this is what's happened. And they're like, we have bigger things to do. We have, and I was like, okay, <laughs> cool, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're like, can we just get rid of this? Can we, do we have to deal with it? I'm like, do you could do whatever you want. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. You could do whatever you want with it. And they're like, we've got all these other issues going on. Like they're all at DefCon one. And I'm like, okay, you you choose whatever you want to do. It's your game. Wow. But yeah, I was kind of like, I was very excited to be like, oh come on, you know, what are we gonna do with the dead alien? And they're like, I literally could not care. Cool. Wow, that's great. Yeah. It sounds yeah. It sounds like they were a very focused UN and, and really yeah. trying to solve the issues, which is, <laughs> in my experience, often not the case. Dedicated yeah. civil servants. <laughs> yeah, they were. Well, I mean, most of the time, a lot of it was kind of like, Russia, why aren't you going down from DEFCON 1? I will go down from DEFCON 1 when you guys go down for DEFCON 1. No, no, we're waiting for you to go down first. No, 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 you go first. No, you, no, you. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's, let's do something. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's just working with other people you know and mm. I, I think it's it's good in a game like this where you know we kind of said at the start like it's it's all you know you don't have to be it's not serious like you know don't don't take it to heart you know and a lot of everyone mm. obviously most understood that but um it was fun i think for people to you know play fight with mm. with the other teams did you um the the UN, I think, is like a unique part of uh, that. Well, I mean, I guess we'll get to science, but uh, off the bat, the UN is sort of a, a unique part of the game when people come in from a board game background and they see the map and they see the pieces moving and they see the poker chips and the, you know, the dice and stuff. And then the UN is more or less like a, more of a role play uh, simulating politics kind of game. Did you encounter anyone in the Adelaide crowd who struggled with that and did you need to help prompt them or um, did they sort of take to it? To it pretty quickly. Like at the start when, you know, first turn, they were like, oh, so what do we do? And I'm like, well, I'll give you a crisis that's been a crisis, crises, crisis, whatever, that's been drawn and you guys have to decide what you're going to do and this is what will happen if you don't do it, you know, and you guys can just take this time to discuss you know, how you guys are going to work together and write treaties if you need to. And they were like, oh, okay, cool. And then they just kind of took it from there. And I was like, good, excellent. I can step back and mm. let you guys go and, you know, jump in if they're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> I think once the game started, everyone everyone got with it quite quickly. But definitely in the pregame, I was fielding a lot of questions from... um from people that, you know, with a heavy board game background who, mm. you know, they had a lot of questions about edge cases or things that were ill-defined in the rules. And I think that, you know, that speaks to the fact that a lot of our player base, you know, comes from a board gaming community and Watch the Skies is definitely a role-playing game. Mm. And so a lot of them found it kind of confronting initially that there was just so little that was explicitly defined in the rules. Um and then I think the first kind of crisis they dealt with in the UN was really a big learning experience. I think there was it was a civil war. I think in in Paraguay, yeah, was the yeah. turn one crisis. Uh, and I think they, you know, the UN decided they were going to send food aid to the civil war. And you know, Katie came and told us that that's what they decided to respond with. And we were like, does that really sound like an appropriate response to a civil war? <laughs> And yeah. we were like, no, we don't think so. That's going to continue um, into next turn. And I think that was kind of the learning experience of like, ah, oh, you know, it, it was triggered that kind of 
the mentality shift of, well, we need to think about this as an actual problem, not as mm-hmm. like a board gaming problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they, but I guess that also then stemming from that, they were like, okay, well, we're just going to send everyone in we're going to send all of the you know the military the un troops in to help them and um they uh they sent her a little too hard and there was like a big public backlash and so then the un had to like put some sanctions on themselves (laughs) because they just they said they're like oh okay we we may have um put too many uh peacekeepers in there to, yeah, uh, that, keep... was, that was pretty funny. They mustered the entire military might of the UN, uh, yeah. and then they had a note attached to this stack of military units with a, you know an outline of what they were there to do, and the the text said, "Secure the country at any cost." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> you guys are messed up now." <laughs> <All right>. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. How many um how much of your players would you say? Um, this was their first mega game. Was it most of them, would you say? Oh, I'm going to have to throw that one to Monty because there were a lot of new faces for me, but there were definitely returning players. Yeah, um, I think probably like a rough number would be about half. Um, uh, I Yes. Um, no, that was um, pretty good as far as I'm concerned. So we had a bit of um, old and new um, experience in which was definitely appreciated. I wasn't able to focus too much of my attention on this game because at the time I was finishing my honours, um, so I took a back seat on a lot of the organising side of things. Um, uh, so science control for me was a nice, relaxing role compared to everything else. Um, uh, I heard stories um, from the other control about... Um, UN overreaching and dead aliens. Um, meanwhile, just scientists were just having a lovely little time in the International Science Conference, talking about all of their stories, not really caring about how the rest of the world is going, as long as science gets done and people get their credit. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Lovely. So let's move on that science bit of the game. Um, yeah, for those who haven't played Watch the Skies, um, if you are out there, there is... Uh, The science part of the game is usually about researching various pieces of tech, um, especially taken from the aliens who have been potentially shot down by the generals on the teams. Um, And yeah, sorry, Monty, I may have cut you off a bit there. How uh, did you find that on the day? Uh, No, it's fine. Um, uh, I think on the day it was pretty okay. We still had a few people who didn't really get um, uh, like the talking part of the science conference, but that was, that was amended very quickly um, where people just had the funniest ideas loosely relating to um, stuff happening in the world at the time. Um, the, the, the creating science game and technologies was always a very interesting experience um, uh, as opposed to the very respectful, respectful and refined um discussions during the conference as soon as the um as soon as the great market alien technology appeared everyone was just scrabbling for whatever pieces they needed um uh, and were just trying to acquire them as quickly as possible and i appreciated the change in pace between those two parts of the science team uh there was there was a little confusion um, regarding certain pieces of the like alien technology and how they fit in. I think halfway through the game, one of the teams um, came up to me with a piece of alien technology called Unidentified Alien Scrap or something like that, um, and were hoping to see if they could. Pause. Um, uh, but at that time, I think they just hadn't received the card and just realized it was one of the regular cards in the deck. That was definitely one of the more amusing aspects of the um uh, of the rules queries for me. I definitely my favorite part out of the um science team was the long and intricate stories um across the various turns that different teams had for um what they were doing back at their home base for their science. Um I think 
one team had this like continually developing storyline on one piece of like butcher paper where they were talking about how to um stop viruses from infecting humans by giving them um entertainment and netflix and then they wanted to make their own content so they wanted funding to pay for virus um hollywood broadway and animation studios that was definitely one of the more iconic ones another team um uh, decided to go in another bend where they just proceeded to make versions of technology which got more and more raunchy as um the game <laughs> just trying to keep this as family friendly as possible yeah. I, don't, I don't know if justin and Keddy remember anything about this oh no hey, oh yep i do <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh well, wow. okay. It we was have a, an after dark episode, maybe Monty. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Well, you can just I don't know how. Everything. Probably for the best. <laughs> well, that's a that is the last thing I expected you to say out of the out of that part of the game. So bravo. It is also the last thing I expected to facilitate out of that part of the game. <laughs> Jeez. Moving the warm-up side of the game, uh, which is generally where generals will go to uh, shoot down aliens and uh, recover some of that alien tech. Um, were you involved in that? Were any involved in, or do it, did any of you have thoughts on that side of the game and how it went? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was kind of floating over everything, so I've got I had reasonable visibility on each part of the game. Uh, I think the war map was where a lot of players kind of felt the most at home, you know, bearing the most similarity to a board game. Um, so generally it went it went pretty smoothly and pretty pretty well. Um, the first turn when the first alien saucer showed up was absolute chaos as each team fielded its entire military to intercept it. Uh, but after that it was it was a lot less hectic as you know players kind of yeah, as they settled into the flow of the game, they realized, you know, what things were worth worrying about, which things were not. I was trying to think if there was anything that crazy that happened there. Oh yeah, there was there was two things. So one of the one of the things that happened that triggered uh worldwide hysteria was a um uh one of the crises was an ancient pyramid was, you know, had appeared um, in Canada, you know, under the melting um, glaciers. Uh, and teams began investigating it, other teams, and then rumors just began appearing that, you know, it was some kind of doomsday device. And, you know, you know how those things evolve in mega games. One person says something mm. and then it just evolves into this all encompassing. Mm. Um, yeah, it's all encompassing rumor. Everyone becomes absolutely consumed by it, and they're scrambling to, you know, uncover everything they can uh, about this random pyramid that was meant to appear and then be resolved in a single turn. Of course. And so people were, yeah, nations were mustering, you know, huge expeditions to go and strip it of resources or study it or secure it, so other teams couldn't get to it. That was a pretty funny one. And the other, I think the other thing was uh, the Russian team constructed a permanent artificial island off the coast of Australia so that they could be <laughs> considered as having a presence in the Pacific Ocean. So they spent yeah. a bit of time building that. It was, yeah, called, um, it was called Putania, I think. Yeah, Putania, that's right. Oh, no. <laughs> Bloody hell. Yep. Yeah, but all was generally well on the world map until mm. the nukes started to fly in the late game. Of course. Uh, of course. So how, how did that nuclear Armageddon go? At what, at what point did the nukes start to go off? <laughs> uh, I think it was at turn six. So about three quarters of the way through the game, um, you know, the Russian t Russia and US had been kind of agitating with each other. There was a bit of a Cold War brewing. Um, and I'd say the Russian team were the kind of main belligerents, but they weren't, 
acting against the US. They were just trying to get the attention of the alien team. Like they had been reaching out to the aliens every turn, trying to gain an audience with them, and they were just being ignored. And so they decided that, you know, they just, if they hadn't got the attention of the aliens by turn six, they were going to, you know, do something really drastic. So they, they went to DEFCON 1, I think, two turns prior to that. And then there was, uh, there was panic circulating amongst the players about the alien mind control, which is, um, yeah, you know, nobody knew exactly how it worked or what its impact would be, but, you know, the players themselves were concerned that they would become mind controlled and forced to act against the interests of their team. So when Russia decided that the nukes Ooh. were going to fly and that it would be targeting all of the nations that the aliens had been speaking to instead of them, uh, the president came to me with a signed order to fire the nukes next turn um, as like a, as a contingency in case he got mind controlled and tried to <laughs> try to stop it. Good. Uh, but that turn <laughs> he was actually, he was granted an audience with the aliens. And so he came to me. Uh, and with the rest of his team, and he's like, "Oh, I'm I'm going to the moon to meet the aliens. Um, in case I get mind controlled, you know, if I come back and tell you to stand down, it's because I've been mind controlled." Mm-hmm. And so off he went <laughs> to the moon, had his audience with the aliens. Um, he did not get mind controlled on the moon, but he did come back and tell them to stand down, and his team were like, "He's been mind controlled!" And then they launched the nukes. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Like you couldn't write that. Brilliant. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was glorious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing could possibly go wrong. One little thing to add regarding the whole mind control side story. I think it only started with one team, um, uh, just who got the mind control technology, read it, and just immediately fell into panic and just rushed to get technology out as quickly as possible. And then that oh, sort of like started shield, the yeah. chain. Yes, mm. um, and that side of the chain effect um, throughout the rest of the teams. Some teams definitely um, stood steadfast on saying, mind control is a hoax, it's never going to happen. Um, but eventually, most of them started to end. Um, and I went to the alien control periodically throughout the game and said, okay, this team is now defended from mind control, and now this team is. Um, but I think about after the third time I went up, um, the alien control went to me and said, yeah, I don't think the alien team is interested in mind control technology at all. Yeah, they went the entire game without researching it. Which I found incredibly funny. Exactly the kind of paranoia and gossip that constantly pops up in these games. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's always great just to watch it unfold. <laughs> and so awesome. I guess the final piece of the puzzle for the, the, the political teams is the, the leader. Um, but you, you've kind of already segued into their role in, uh, commu- like you know, making the big decisions, but also communicating with the aliens. Um, obviously, we'll put a little spoiler disclaimer here. But um, how did the how did the game go from the alien perspective, and how did they interact with the human teams? What was the um, the scenario that you had set up? So the aliens, when they arrived, their kind of briefing was to make an assessment of whether humanity was deserving of being elevated into, you know, their, uh, the reticulan empire, which is, you know, this galaxy spanning civilization, Mm. uh, with, you know, that's on paper is a conglomerate of a few different races. And so their brief was, yeah, our humanity fit to be a part of this someday. Uh, and then the alien, but the alien team themselves. So they had this, you know, they had this briefing on paper, and they knew that initially they had to, they had to conduct some behavioral studies of humanity, and then after that they were free to kind of, once they completed those, um, so mechanically those were the first two technologies the alien team had to complete, was this behavioral study, and once that was done, it was very much up to them to kind of chart their own course after that. So they were free to interpret the results of that however they wanted, you know, whether humanity was worth investing time in or whether they should just be ignored or potentially even uh, contained or eliminated. You know, it was really up to the aliens. And 
speaking to a few of them, at, you know, ahead of the game, you know, they weren't sure which way they were going to go with that either. They all, you know, were happy to figure that out on the day. Mm. Uh, but initially it seemed like they were just out to troll humanity, <laughs> which was pretty <laughs> funny. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, they kind of, I think the Chinese team was the first one to actually speak to the aliens face to face. And after that, the aliens became much more invested in um, in preventing humanity from consuming itself, you know, with paranoia and fear and warfare. Um, the aliens became yeah very active in in undermining hostile actions that were you know that were looming between you know Russia and the U.S. or um, or I think China at one point was looking a bit ominous, and so the aliens began their work to put a stop to all that. You know, they decided humanity needed to be pacified, I think was the word they used. Right. And then, yeah, once the nukes started to fly, they really kicked that plan into high gear. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the nukes a couple of times. Uh, did this watch, I mean, you, you said before, Justin, that the, the weapons exchange kind of kicked off um turn six or so did you have any any really outlandish last turn madness with this watch the skies uh none that i would consider to be terribly egregious which was a nice change i mean you know how i feel about that pat i really Mm -hmm. don't like the um that mentality that emerges in the final turn yeah uh Mm -hmm. and yeah everyone kind of stuck to their guns and stuck to their kind of team motivation throughout the whole thing which was uh, yeah quite refreshing actually i liked that a lot um so no one did anything too too nuts um one team did try to smuggle a nuke to the moon to take out the aliens uh, but they were unsuccessful um that's, that's the plot of a movie i'm pretty sure <laughs> yeah it sounded a bit familiar what did, the, what did the media do again i can't remember i can't remember now the media. the media, oh yeah, they they had a great time. They were. Um... Mm. They ended up. Um, I think they had like a contingency plan or something to, to get them off the planet, um, in the case that the the world exploded. Mm. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, well, for anyone who's not familiar, so the media team is like this small, kind of, side team that exists, as their own entity that are kind of observers of the game. Like they're still a part of the game world, but they their purpose is kind of just to capture information and help to relay that around to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they decided, you know, they wanted to be a bit more active. So they decided that they wanted to have a direct line of communication with the alien team. And to do that, they needed money. So they began accepting bribes from the various nations for preferential coverage in the media. And I think in about, you know, they came to me saying they wanted to establish this line of communication with the aliens. And I said, you know, it will require X X million dollars to do that. (laughs) And I think within one turn, they had accumulated all of it just from (laughs) offering their uh, media services to everybody. They started, yeah, promising that, you know, you could do political hit pieces on other nations for a fee. And everyone (laughs) flooded to them with, and opened up their wallets. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Well, looking at it in totality, um, yeah, how did you feel about the event? Did you have any big um, worries before the day the, or areas you weren't sure about? And, yeah, how do you feel like those things came out in practice? Um, I was not too concerned. I think that's because I'm a jaded old mega gamer now and once you've once you've played and run in a couple you've played and run in them all so i was i was not too concerned i thought we would we would do fine you know having seen monty and his team run mm. god emperor i was pretty confident in in how they were going to go mm. um, and having played in watch the skies and similar games a few times i felt i was feeling pretty comfortable in my like understanding of the rules and you know the tone of the game and how things should happen. So I was feeling pretty confident things would go well. Um, and I think they did. I think everyone had a really great time. Um, but I won't monopolize this too much. Katie and Monty can kind of a bit of a, bit of a chat about how they felt. I, I guess was 
just concerned that, you know, making sure that everybody had a good time, um, you know, and want to come back for another one. That's always, you know, mm. something that I would be worried about. Um, but I think, and I did like, you know, throughout the day, I was kind of checking in, like, are you guys having fun? You know, and then we had like a feedback form and I was, you know, being like, please, please write in the feedback form so that we can, you know, take this for next time. Um, but I think, I think the day went really well. Um, it's obviously a very long day. We're very tired by the end of it, but, um, no, I, th I think it went really well. That's good to hear. Yeah. From my side of things, um, uh, we didn't have too much issue with, um, with a lot. Um, one of the recurring unfortunate themes that have happened that I've had to, um, encounter a lot of times is problems with the room booking which i think has occurred in every game i've run and so um uh, this right. one i think was the most relaxing um so to speak i don't think we had any major issues this time which was a welcome change of pace from prior ones awesome that's always good to to hear um yeah we've yeah we've actually had a few debacles here in sydney a um, couple of times it's always a bit of a gamble um, depending on the space and who you're dealing with no absolutely in terms of um player stuff though um one of the design things um uh, when we did crisis in elysian in melbourne we saw that they had someone dedicated to the welfare officer mm -hmm. um, in the game and i believe that was a very important if not crucial position to requisition for any future games we held in adelaide certainly i think that was yeah really important yeah definitely it seems like a um a standard sort of piece of the furniture in the in the modern mega games which is awesome yes i'm very glad i heard about it as early in my career as i did because i don't think if i am uh traveled um to play in another mega game i don't think i would have experienced it because i hadn't heard about it in much of the um discussion online i've heard so far so that was very good to find spontaneously um and co-opt but yes i think every mega game we've had so far has been better than the last one in all accounts from control experience and organization to logistics to player happiness um so i'm i'm very happy how this one turned out hmm. yeah it sounds like it was a really good well very successful it sounds like um, the adelaide experience so far has been generally um positive and successful um getting three games off off the ground in um just over a year is pretty exciting. The um, Adelaide Mega Games Discord uh, ahead of this, which we'll have a link to in the in the notes. Ahead of this game, I did see Justin a few people asking a lot of questions about rules and hypotheticals, that kind of thing. I think you touched on this briefly earlier, where you talked about some of the some of the crowd coming from a very um, board game background. But um, did you find? that this particular rule set um, was more difficult for people to understand from the get-go? Um, I don't think it was difficult to understand. I think it just it left a lot of space that players were not necessarily comfortable with ahead of time. Um, whereas, you know, because, you know, I mean, as you know, Pat, I've been doing this for a while now, almost 10 years, and so I'm too close to the issue i would say and you know are very comfortable just having having the bare bones there to you know allow players to really take the initiative and kind of take the game in whatever direction they want um whereas a lot of our players are you know really fresh at this and i think having that that really small degree of structure can be kind of confronting if you're not used to that approach and you know you don't think in that mindset especially if you're a, you know a pretty hardcore um, board gamer it's kind of yeah a completely different mindset to the one you would normally bring to any sort of game you would play yeah right 
But I think Watch the Skies itself is very simple. Um, some I know a lot of mega games do a turn zero to allow people to get to grips with how the game operates. Um, but for Watch the Skies, I didn't feel like that was in, that was necessary because it is, you know, the virtue of it being so ill-defined means that players can pick it up very, very quickly. There's not a lot of, you don't have to keep a whole bunch of rules and potentially like conflicting situations and circumstances in your head. You can, you can just kind of roll with it. So yeah, I think everyone picked it up really quickly once they were there in person. Awesome. And did you find that the having watched the skies and the watch the skies name out there, did, do you think that made it easier for you to find players? Uh, I'm not sure. It probably helped, but I think the main reason it was so easy for us to, you know, sell out the game was really just the work Monty had already done in cultivating a bit of a following here. Well, that's awesome. It sounds like um, the community is really well developed at this point, and uh, it's not too hard to bring in, bring the bring the regulars in and the new faces, which is exciting. Awesome. So. Yeah, with all of that, what what would you say was your biggest takeaway from running Watch the Skies for future Adelaide Mega Games? Is there any big lessons or, yeah, interesting design tidbits? Um, the, I mean, the Welfare Officer is one awesome one, I think, but uh, anything else in there that you feel like would be awesome to bring into the next one? Uh, n- yeah, not really anything from me. Katie? I was just going to say, you know, having that break for lunch... And I know it doesn't mm. happen in every mega game, but having a break for lunch was great. Ooh, no, no breaks. I am a huge, I am a huge believer in the break for lunch, and yes, it I is will fight very for that. dividing. It's it's very dividing. I agree. Um, I really like it because you know, especially if you're a player, just having, you know, because well, on the weekend we were in Melbourne playing, so say we all, and just having that time to just you know hop out of the room. And go and have something to eat and just, you know, let your brain go brr for, you know, half an hour or so. I really liked it. <laughs> but obviously, you know, I, I know Justin isn't a big fan of it, but uh, you get what you get. <laughs> Monty, there's no wrong answers, but what side of this coin are you on? <laughs> um, I am firmly and steadfastly on the break um, uh, side of things. Yeah. Ooh, we outnumber you all then. <laughs> well, that was why we had a break for lunch. I was outnumbered. <laughs> as much as I would like Adelaide Mega Games to be an autocracy, it is mm. not. Not yet. I'm the president, and I say no. <laughs> really, as I was, um, as I was listening to you earlier um, when you were talking about Last Turn Madness, Justin, I wrote down a note here that maybe for a future podcast episode we should have a debate like an actual structured debate about something like Last Turn Madness. And maybe uh, lunch breaks can also go on that list. <laughs> mm. I think it'll get very heated. I, um, like, I like Last Turn Madness, so I, I'd be keen. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be great. Um, stay tuned. But um, I guess um, just we probably need to wrap up. Um, but Monty... What did you, this was your third game um, running and the fifth mega game in, in total, it sounds like, in a very short time, uh, which is pretty exciting for, you know, just generally for the Australian um, mega game scene to be running things this actively. What uh, what was your biggest takeaway for, um, for future games from Watch the Skies? Uh, my biggest takeaway for this game in particular was, I think, just being able to spread the work around a lot more, um, especially for the previous two games that I had um, run. I definitely put a lot of, um, a lot of effort. I de- definitely think I should have myself that I feel like could have easily been delivered among the rest of the control team. Um, so just being able to take a step back and get more of a wide picture of things so I can see where skills can better be applied, I think is one of the major things I'm going to be taking into the future. Mm. That's a good lesson to learn. And then I suppose I'll throw my final question to the three of you. Um, but I might, I might say you first, Monty, just to, just to put, just to set you up. But what is next for Adelaide Mega Games in your eyes? Um, in 2024, what are we going to see? Um, 
Honestly, I don't really know at this point. Um, uh, I believe there's been discussions um, uh, about running games, although we don't know exactly when. Um, uh, at least from my perspective, I don't really have much interest in designing a game myself, but I'm happy to work alongside others who design their own games, such as Justin. I mean... I know, yeah, with, from talks with Justin, we were kind of planning um, maybe two or th three at the most games next year. Um, you know, kind of one maybe April and then mid-year and then maybe, yeah, like October, November. Um, but mm -hmm. I would be, I mean... I guess being on the, the panel at PAX and, you know, having them sort of design a game, like, at the panel kind of gave me a couple of ideas to um, mm. maybe, you know, have a think about. I don't know how great they'll be, but, um, you know, I think it'll definitely be a good experience to, to, to try. And, um, yeah, I'm keen to definitely play more next year. Mm. Um, yeah. I think I, I definitely... I'm a better player than a mod, I'd like to say, just because <laughs> I am chaos. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I think well, Pat will know because he's seen me play <laughs> a few you, games. <laughs> you were the chaos on the INC. <laughs> I am. I was, and I am, and yep. Um, but um, <laughs> I'm very yeah, still very excited to do more next year mm. and i'm trying to i'm looking i'm gonna look into merch i want merch i saw melbourne has merch i'm like mm. i want that yeah good good everyone loves merch justin what's 2024 for you in adelaide make a game wise yeah i'm really hoping that we can kind of take 2024 as our year to build to like that critical mass of of players and a design team um, I know this is something that you this has been on your to-do list for ages, Pat, and I don't think it will happen this year coming up. Uh, I, I do want to get to the point where there are other people that are sufficiently comfortable with the design and, and run process that, you know, mm. that I don't have to be driving every single game. And I know mm. that will take a little while. So yeah. I've got, um, yeah, I want to commit to running two games in 2024 hopefully three but i definitely will will definitely do two and i'm hoping to fit in a third one um i think it's probably time for some of my like our homegrown adelaide games mm -hmm. i've got a few ideas on the boil that we could do um but there's also uh, currently there are no like out of the box games that are available that i'm that interested in Currently, you know, Currently. there may be some, yeah, down the track, I might find one be like, that's really cool. We want to do <laughs> that one. But currently, I'm, I'm feeling the, uh, I've got, I've got the creative itch currently. So I'm, I'm hoping that our next game will probably be one that I've made, but we'll see. We'll see. So say we all. And <laughs> I think we'll give that a bit of breathing space. <laughs> yeah. um, there are some tweaks that I want to make to it, having mm -hmm. now played in it as well. Um, yeah, I think there's some room for improvement there. So yeah, exciting times. Um, yeah. And if anyone listening is in and around Adelaide, Adelaide, sorry, you should absolutely stay tuned. Um, I think that does bring us to the end of our show, and so the only. Last bit is to ask you all where the best place is for people to tune in for more information about Adelaide Mega Games or you individually. Yeah, we are on Discord. We are on Instagram. We are sort of on Facebook, not as much, but I'm trying. Um, and that's it's just at, at Adelaide Mega Games. Um, you know, there'll be more, maybe. Maybe I might do a, a YouTube channel, maybe? YouTube oh, channel, that's interesting. Everything, everything raised in this podcast is a commitment. Just by yeah. 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 Um, you are sworn to do this now. <laughs> that's fine. I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we can find something. You'll um, need the, you'll need a, a YouTube for the developer diaries you put up for the mega game that you're going to design next year. Yeah. Um, oh God. I don't know. Well, that's, yeah, I'm kind of, 
All right, I'll say it here first. I want to try and design a game next year. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Good, whether... <laughs> good. <laughs> um, we'll see, you know. It'll probably be very... Um, awesome. A fun, a fun, a fun... Well, not like a serious game. It'll be a, a not serious game. A very relaxing... Because as I do say, um, you know, the game is fake, but the stress is real. I don't know if <laughs> relaxing and mega game go together, though. I'm going to try. I, I will try. We're going to um, hold you to it. Yeah, we'll try. We'll see. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, we'll include those in the notes below. Um, thank you so much all for coming on. It's so wonderful to th see things sprouting up in Adelaide and across Australia and to see how vibrant the mega game scene in general feels like it's getting at the moment. It's awesome. 